Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to joining us to a MIPIM Connect session on global innovations in affordable housing. I'm Alex Nose and I'm a fund director at PFP Capital, which is part of the Places for People group, one of the largest affordable housing providers in the UK. I'm really thrilled to have a super expert global panel staying up at all times of the night to, to join us for this recording. Um, and we're going to have a little look at the, these kind of innovations that can happen. We know that a shortage of quality of affordable housing is something that affects every city in the world, but the implications now that we're all living through this pandemic are, are kind of even more important that we try to innovate the way that we finance it and deliver affordable housing. Um, I'm going to ask Adam Chalice, who's the Executive Director Research and Strategy for the whole of EMEA at JLL to give us an overview before we start and I'll introduce our experts as we go through from the UK, from South Africa and from Australia. We'll each be able to give us a sort of mini case study of the areas that they work in before we then have a bit of a panel discussion. Um, so without too much ado, Adam, you guys have been pioneering the kind of living asset class at JLL. Could you just give us a bit of an overview on what you're seeing around affordable housing? Yeah, thanks very much, Alex. Uh, uh, delighted to, uh, to be able to, to share some views. In fact, I'll, um, I'm just going to uh, uh, put up a few slides on screen that I think will, will help frame the, the comments I want to uh, I want to raise today. Uh, notably around, um, uh, you know, a lens or, 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 or viewing the um, innovations in affordable housing through the lens of COVID-19. Uh, when we originally planned to do this for, for MIPIM, it wasn't uh, perhaps quite so, uh, uh, so poignant an issue to, to, to uh, unpack, but clearly innovations going forward will have to incorporate many of the, the lessons that we picked up through COVID-19. And uh, perhaps the most, um, uh, most profound or uh, the, the one that people talk about most is the adoption of technology, just like this is a great example of us uh, working from home and, and, and collaborating and sharing ideas. Uh, we, we think more about technology as having uh, accelerated a lot of or been an accelerated change rather than being a, a net new change. And that I think permeates many of the issues that we're facing with respect to affordable housing delivery, because ultimately uh, it's around uh, it's around access. So uh, I often talk um, in in conversations like this these days about the the renatured hierarchy of live, work, and play, where work often was the defining feature that drove our living and uh, and leisure choices, where we choose to 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 to, to buy or to rent or where we need to uh, need uh, appropriate accommodation, and and of course the community in, in which that sits. Now, in a world where we're remote working to, uh, to greater degrees, uh, varying degrees, but greater degrees on, on balance. Uh, there's a presumption, which is easy for folk like us, to think that this is just the way it's going to be, or a version of this. And of course, that's just not true. Across society, there are quite stark differences between uh, those that have roles that allow them to, to leverage technology to uh, disperse and make different uh, choices on where they want to live and where in the communities they'll, they'll be in. But clearly, Plenty of, plenty of jobs, uh, lower level service sector jobs, manufacturing jobs, uh, many public services as well, uh, require you to be in a physical place of work. And that of course means that uh, the COVID-19 technology adoption uh, conversation is, is uh, often being played as too simplistic. Uh, we think about um, the technology adoption as having many different touch points across our housing requirements. And this slide just uh, really is a, is, is a non-exhaustive set of, uh, of a few of those, those issues that, um, uh, that, that technology will, uh, will uh, enable or adjust. But the point that I'd want to get across, uh, as I just picked up in the, in the previous slide, is that having access to technology is not in and of itself um, uh, a guarantee for greater social inclusion, because clearly access in technology itself is, uh, is not universal. Uh, so while we can see that um, a greater proportion of the population will be using telehealth, it may not be universally accessible uh, um, uh, and will have uh, big differences in geographical as well as uh, social strata as to who is adopting um, uh, telehealth. You can see uh, great opportunities potentially through this environment and a, a low base rate environment for, for big capital flows from the private sector to enable greater swathes of affordable Housing, but that won't be true for all locations. It won't be true uh, for uh, for all providers of affordable housing. And uh, the the point that I just want to be be really deliberate on is uh, that while there are some big uh, universal changes that are uh, that are shifting or that are accelerating as a result of COVID nineteen and and the technology adoption point, uh, 
they will not manifest equally. One that I want to belabor is uh, a topic that is, is of huge importance to all of us, uh, and we've spent plenty of time uh, thinking about sustainable homes and sustainable delivery at JLL. Uh, again, uh, you can see technology being an enabler for uh, sustainable delivery, and you can see uh, a whole range of different um, uh, value propositions that, uh, that hit not just uh, landlords in the, in the social housing uh, space or tenants in terms of uh, improved quality of life, um, uh, lower, lower costs of uh, our operating costs of, of the home, uh, but also wider dispersal of positive impacts to, to government in, in ultimately in improving quality of life again, but, but reducing some of the, the costs on, uh, on health and, and other uh, public services. So a whole range of, uh, of long-term benefits from driving sustainable delivery of affordable homes. Uh, of course, not straightforward to, uh, to deliver in policy terms and uh, seen by many as a as a complicating factor or more expensive complicating factor in an environment where we're going to be going through an economic recovery and where some delivery and supply will be uh, even more challenging than it was prior to COVID-19. I just want to broaden that out now and um, uh, just touch on some uh, some work that I have the, the pleasure of, uh, of being involved in with World Habitat as a board trustee uh, and, uh, and and perhaps just move a little bit beyond COVID-19, but, uh, but still recognizing it as a, as a, as a bit of a, a lens to some of this work. And on the right-hand side, uh, reference to the, um, uh, the End Street Homelessness uh, Campaign across Europe, uh, it's been an extraordinary shift that I think those in the homelessness space um, uh, almost never really dared dream that you could, uh, quote unquote, end homelessness. But in effect, that's, that's kind of what happened across Europe to, to uh, a large degree in the in the UK, about fifteen thousand people were taken off the streets out of rough sleeping and into temporary accommodation. And it proved that it was possible that where there is a will, there is a way. Of course, with a policy imperative. And the point that I guess I want to get across with that that example is that uh, you can see localized solutions, um, targeted solutions, having quite wide application. One of the things that World Habitat does so well and there are of course plenty of other organizations that uh, that do similar things and uh, the, the document on the left hand side is a very good uh, reference tool in this respect is to take those localized solutions and develop an understanding of the uh, the common threads so that they can be uh, aggregated so that they can be spread uh, in terms of wider application and whether that's around identifying solutions around uh, around land around uh, enabling more supply or the right site type of supply the the right sort of policy structures with local government to uh, to deliver targeted solutions, understanding cultural overlays in uh, in local environments in order to deliver the right or the appropriate uh, uh, affordable homes or or uh, sub market homes for for populations. We know that this is a crisis that affects something like 1.6 billion people around the world. Uh, a, a lack of access to healthy and safety safe homes. Uh, so the the need to be able to scale up localized solutions and contextualize them uh, is, is absolutely vital. So uh, that really is a, as a setup piece, it's a, a, sort of a wide range of, uh, of, of different issues that I think we'll, um, we'll unpack in our, in our discussion. Uh, thanks a lot. Fantastic, Adam. Thank you so much. That's a super helpful overview. Um, so I'd just like to go into our sort of little case studies now, starting off, um, we're hearing from Olivia Harris, who's the CEO of Dolphin Living which is a small London-based charity in the UK specialising on housing, affordable housing for Londoners. Um, they've got over, I think it's 630 homes for rent and further 200 under construction. Olivia, correct me if I'm wrong, across kind of inner London. Um, but it's also pioneered some really innovative sort of different financing models. So um, Olivia, over to you. All right, I'm just gonna try and share my screen. Hopefully that's gonna work. Um, so Alex, we're actually up to, uh, we just had some homes complete uh, during lockdown, so we're now at uh, 800 homes and a Fantastic. lot less under construction, thankfully, very luckily. <laughs> so our, as you've already said, our target beneficiaries are those on modest incomes, uh, median earners, key workers who work but can't afford market rents from their earned income. Um, and these workers in the UK fall between the gaps in housing policy, which is targeted at those that can afford to buy um, and um, or those that qualify for social housing because they're in acute housing need. Um, so the first uh, 
innovative example that I would like to share with you is, if I can get the screen to move on, no, hold on one minute please, uh, is the Westminster Home Ownership Accelerator. Um, so one of the main barriers to buying a home in the UK is um, the amount of deposit you require and the Westminster Home Ownership Accelerator helps working Londoners on modest incomes to acquire their first home. So it does this by simulating the home ownership experience, the early home ownership experience of previous generations, where by having saved a small deposit, people could buy a small home, which after a few years and some house price growth meant they'd amassed a greater deposit um, from which they could purchase a larger, more permanent home. So in the home ownership accelerator, participants must have saved at least two and a half thousand pounds their first home ownership experience is actually three years in a rental flat, which they pay 65% of market rent for, which means they can save more. And at the end of a tenancy of up to three years, they receive a grant from Dolphin Living, reflecting house price growth during the term of their tenancy, which they can invest alongside their own savings in buying a home. Uh, and then the next example I want to share with you is um, <clears throat> our personalised rent policy. So in London, an affordable rent, as defined by the Greater London Authority, is either 40% of net earnings or a third of median income. But these calculations don't take into account different household compositions. So in a one bedroom flat, for example, you might have a couple or you might have a single person living them. They have very different um, uh, you know, living costs. And we have a personalised rent model, which we can create for any type of household where we use the Joseph Browntree minimum income standards to work out what their living costs should be. And these are the living costs that they need in order to be able to participate in society. And these are constant, irrespective of their earnings. So if you look at the graph I'm showing, that blue band in the middle is, is, the, is the living costs. And uh, household earning capacity increases. What we do is we say that, so their rent increases, um, but so as not to disincentivize people from earning more, only half of their increase goes into rent and half um, goes into, they have extra disposable income shown, shown here on the graph, that top slice is sort of a light grey blue. Um, so we've implemented this policy at New Era Estate in Hackney and at Porchester Road in Westminster. And it ensures that each tenant has the subsidy they need so that they can afford to pay their rent. But it also means that the subsidy that is implicit in affordable housing is used to help those that need it most. And as a landlord, we can target an overall rent for each estate. And as some people become a bit better off and, you know, the, how, the stability that housing provides means that their earning capacity increases. So they pay a bit more rent, which means when other homes fall vacant, we can let them at the lowest possible rent to those that need them the most. So um, those are the two examples that hopefully we can have some more discussion on later. Thank you. Fantastic, Olivia. Thank you. And I, I know it's really interesting because the personalised rent idea is something that we've seen before in various North American contexts. But as far as I know, you guys really pioneered it in the UK. So it'd be great if you've had any kind of conversations with kind of other authorities or other organisations wanting to use it. But um, we'll come back to that. Thank you so much. So moving across now to, to South Africa. So calling beautiful Stellenbosch. Hello, Harold. Harold Spies is the founder of Simulin Properties, um, founded in 2010 to create sustainable residential developments. Um, but that challenge the norms of affordable housing development. And I think we all know those kind of negative uh, perceptions that hang around um, and really have a life cycle focus as, as alluded to by Adam earlier that you guys go on from development, but also you really manage your communities a long time after construction in very hands-on way. So Harold, over to you. Great, thanks Alex. Yeah, we're, um, we're an affordable housing developer um, in the South African context. I think uh, when I talk to my peers in other countries, our uh, terminology for what affordability means and what uh, we often find in the European, American or Australian markets differ quite widely. Um, for us, it's, a, it's about an income of um, between $1,000 and $1,500 uh, per month for a household income. That kind of defies what affordable housing in South African terms means. Anything below that is what we term the gap market. Um, and that gap market sits between where government subsidized housing kicks in, which is a dismal $200. Um, so any household family or family that earns a household income above $200 falls outside the bracket where government can, can intervene. 
Um, and then obviously market forces prevail and then um, wherever somebody can then afford to buy or purchase or rent their own property um, sits round about where, where we start, which is that thousand dollars on South African Rand terms, it's about 15,000 Rand. So where we come in is, is that um, we're an institutional housing developer. Um, we access funds from, from housing institutions and from institutional funders like big pension funds, um, the same as that you would do as well. Um, we've seen a substantial increase in um, impact funds who play in the South African and African market as well. And we, we try and access that funding where we can as well. I'm going to maybe just share a screen with you um, to give you an idea of, of what we do. If you give me a second, there we go. So um, we play in the, the classic or in your BTR market or PSR market um, and we provide housing from bed sit units, the type of, of studio units up until three, three bedroom units. And we've got a few drivers in South Africa that's really important to us. Uh, first one is definitely sustainability and why we say sustainability, um, it ties very closely into energy security as well. So um, the fact that you have electricity and water in an urban environment is not necessarily a given. So, so we've, um, we've been quite interested and um, proactive in how we design our developments. Um, to give energy security means that we have to then provide often water, but also electricity um, where a local government or a local municipality can't. But more than that is, is um, we're a social enterprise. So we, um, we're quite focused on providing sustainable housing solutions. And that's the integrated term that we all use, but it's, um, it's about creating stickiness for people to want to live there. So we try and challenge the norm of what's available for housing in the South African context, um, provide a, a sustainable development where we lay a green over it. Um, that means that we provide, we, we uh, develop our own energy, we provide water solutions, we overlay prop tech over that, so how do we manage those, those developments? Um, and then obviously to try and create the bigger social impact that we can within a, an urban environment. So we kind of have a, a term to say that um, affordable doesn't need to be ugly. Um, and we, we try and push that as far as we can. Um, and we build rental communities. And that's really what we, what we are all about. On this slide, there's a quick slide of a development of ours in Johannesburg, or in Joburg, um, that the water ponds on the right hand side is um, a, a water system where we purify all the grey water from the development and it runs into big attenuation dams and then we, we irrigate our development throughout that. We use PV, big PV plants that sits on top of the buildings and under parking lots. Um, to generate our heat pump system and provide energy. So we try and, and benchmark that we get to around 30 to 40 percent of our energy is developed by, by ourselves and the rest we get from the grid. So these are just a few of our other developments throughout South Africa. I think for us, the, one of the biggest drivers really is urbanization and with COVID as well, we've seen a massive influx of people in a very short space of time into our city, simply because infrastructure in the rural areas cannot keep up and the quality is, is um, of, a, of a questionable nature. So that is something that we see um, creating much bigger shanty towns or informal settlements on the outskirts of our towns. And that's something, as you had alluded to earlier, Adam, 1.6 billion people, a large portion of our country falls within that uh, housing insecurity bracket. So if I were to kind of summarize what, what, um, what the trends in South Africa is, it's really about providing housing, whatever the formal nature of it is in, the, in a formal manner. Um, and that really is about innovating every single part of the value chain and questioning everything that we do on a, on a daily basis. And then obviously accessing knowledge from, from the rest of the world um, and trying to get applications in the South African context. Thanks, Alex. We can chat about the rest later. Super, Harold. Thank you so much. And I know, you know there's one of the really um, you know, negative perceptions often about Africa in general is that, you know, that there's nothing that we in the West can learn from it. And actually, I know from kind of visiting you and seeing what you guys are doing with the prop tech and the utilities, it's way more advanced than anything we've, I've ever seen in the UK. So there's a huge amount of innovation that we really need to learn from 
from what you guys are doing. So thank you it's for sharing that. It's mostly from out of need, Alex. So um, yeah, but that's because, what drives yeah, you know. We find solutions that uh, that isn't available, so we design them and we create them. Yeah, necessity is the mother of invention. That's definitely what we're seeing there. Um, that's super. We'll come back to a load of that stuff. Thank you, Harold. So um, I just like to page into Melbourne and see if Chris is still awake and holding up for us. Um, Chris is the Managing Director of Assemble Communities, which is a resident-focused focus, social and affordable build-to-rent platform. So uh, Chris has a fantastic pipeline of 4,500 apartments. A 1,000 of those are kind of middle-income built-to-rent, um, pretty much the leaders Olivia and Harold are working on, and then a further 3,500 in the more sort of social affordable space. Um, and Chris has also had some really exciting news uh, just last month, I think you announced uh, you're now co-owned by Australian Super, which is the largest uh, superannuation group in Australia. We've taken 25% of the business. So that's a really interesting shift in those capital flows Adam alluded to about institutions really coming into affordable housing in a big way. So Chris, trying to tell us what you guys are up to. Sure, Alex, thank you for telling me. Um, yeah, so that is exciting about the Australian Super announcement. I'll sort of get to that a bit later, but basically all we do at Assemble so <laughs> Chris, we've got a little bit of interference. Sorry, you might just need to hold the mic a little bit closer. Still a bit. Of, that's better. Yeah, is that okay? Maybe go to the old school headphones. Sorry. This call is plagued with tech challenges, but we're going to persevere. It's good. Big ones. My daughter thinks I look like a pilot, but I'm not convinced. That's, that's, that's good. Thank you. We'll go with the pilot because I can hear you much more clearly. Thank you. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so at Assemble, um, we just do social and essential worker housing. So by Australian definition and, you know, the definition is similar globally, um, our rent would not be more than 30% of a very low, low or middle income Australian's uh, annual income. So each year. Um, and that sort of that sort of purpose led piece for um, our pension fund investors, our retirement fund investors, was was key to it. So they get a lot of approaches from build to rent operators and the like, wanting to set up in Australia and sort of pitching in um, housing that's been delivered at some multiple of market rent because it's got a whole bunch of fancy jazzy stuff in it. Um, where we pitched it and based on a research thesis out of sort of Europe and North America and saying, well internationally in multi-family housing sort of where has the space sort of really sort of exploded and grown and where's the sort of biggest need exist um, and institutionally owned long tenure housing made available to very low low and middle income people um, is really the space that we're only playing in we're just playing in that exclusively and thankfully that's sort of been or i guess rewarded in a way not rewarded but sort of acknowledged in a way by saying that's the place that our superannuation investors also want to play in um, so we, you know, we've got a huge opportunity here. We've got a huge need in Australia. You know, over the next um, six years, seven years, we need another four to five hundred thousand dwellings sort of built. So in that sort of space, so we've got um, sort of huge issues as everyone does. But we've got a government at the moment, and it's sort of it's sort of before COVID. So you know, they're sort of been trying to search for solutions and saying we've got these huge amount of sort of liquidity in our pension fund market, and it all sort of goes offshore to invest in housing and infrastructure and whatever else how do we create an investment ecosystem that is attractive to that capital to invest more deeply and to start to solve for some of the issues that we've got domestically um, and so it's been on the radar for a while but i think you know definitely the focus during the last few months has sort of heightened on um there so how do we create sort of tax structures investment structures to uh, mobilize that capital into housing um, so we do um, we do housing sort of two ways, um, which is one is a sort of supported pathway into ownership, which is similar to what Olivia was saying, um, which in our model, we pre-agree up front sort of five years of rent for someone. We say, how much is your sort of rent going to be for five years? And then we pre-agree a price that they can purchase the property for. So, and that was a response to the Australian market in where ownership is really difficult for a lot of people. And ownership's the only way in which you can secure tenure certainty. So otherwise it's sort of year to year leasing and sort of being put in a property owned by a mum and dad investor, for example. So we found that we did a lot of research that if we give people tenure, uh, if we support them. So we've got an in-house financial coaching service where they can access services to help them get a better relationship with money, learn what a mortgage is, these sorts of things and support them 
towards a fixed goal so they're not exposed to market volatility as well um, is that would be a very popular product and we've sort of got over 10,000 people now on a waiting list for to access one of those properties under that model um, and then separate to that is um, an infrastructure style investment model but social and affordable housing so all our BT, all our pure multifamily assets will be 20 percent social rental so and we'll do that in partnership with the community housing sector um, and in the Australian context the community housing sector brings access to some concessional long-term debt and some tax advantages and some other things that is necessary to basically deliver housing it's for sort of like at a net income zero to sort of us as the, the developer so and that's you know and there is pools and pools of capital available domestically in Australia to go into that space and even more so now they're sort of saying so how do we sort of help the people that have helped us during this really difficult time um, and I think sort of investor sentiment is definitely geared towards saying well you know housing's one way in which we can um, we can do that so so yeah so we've got about four and a half thousand dwellings across the portfolio now committed um, and uh, about a thousand of those will be under the first model with the pathway to ownership and the balance will just be for uh, long-term rental and we'll offer five, 10 year leases to our people to allow them to be able to put down roots in a neighborhood and make connections with people, get kids into schools for the duration of their school life, these sorts of things. So, and understanding that um, the environmental sustainability is very important to us, that's at our core, but also the sort of social sustainability and the reduction in housing anxiety and the way that people sort of think about their future is, is also key to the success of a, a neighbourhood. So, yeah, so that's sort of, that's us. Dan. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris. And I, it's brilliant because you've tied up with a lot of the threads. So that security of tenure point is something that is really, really powerful in terms of people feeling comfortable and that their kids are in school and they oh. can put roots down. Um, and and oh, all of you referred to the kind of that gap market point as well. Yeah, I remember one that's pretty sort of interesting sort of, you know, sort of um, thesis on the sort of the Melbourne housing market, but I remember talking to um, this woman and she was a secretary. Her husband was a part-time chef and their household income was about $75,000 Australian. And she's saying that her and her husband didn't even talk about their housing future. So, because that's because they had the rental they were in was owned by mum and dad investor who might just sell it out from under them or whatever, and they'd have to move suburbs again. So, made them too anxious to even have the discussion. So, they just sort of avoided it, which was, yeah, a bit of a, I think, a good sort of lens on, on, on what the market is like for a renter in Australia. Mm. I think it's something like 50% of the Australian sort of population is actually eligible for affordable housing, but the availability of it is incredibly reduced. So it's fantastic it's that you're actually they're kind of plugging that gap. That middle bit, no one thinks about the middle bit. It's a, we sort of operate at the extreme. So, um, mm. So guys, all of you have been tapping into the kind of the wave of institutional money that's suddenly come into this middle gap in the market. Adam, what, what do you think was the trigger that got those kind of big pension firms, those institutions to understand that there were opportunities and living that weren't just big for sale portfolios? What, what do you think triggered that shift and what are the gaps in understanding that we still need to address? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, uh, as you well know, Alex, the, the largest um, investment market in the United States is the multifamily market. Uh, it's, it's larger than than the offices sector or, or the other commercial sectors. And so there's a much deeper pool of, of capital and frankly understanding in the United States about how to invest effectively into the full spectrum of, um, of housing solutions. And the US also has a much smaller proportion of true social housing stock or what we would call social housing stock. And so there's a lot more uh, of what I would call innovation or early stage innovation in the lowercase a affordable spectrum. So as we started to translate in Europe, a lot of that mindset to, uh, to the US and of course the, uh, uh, the continental European story is a, is a different, um, perhaps a different starting point altogether. Uh, we've, we've had a better understanding, I think, of how to use private sector capital more effectively. Now, clearly there are lots of concerns and risks, but, but ultimately as that has also uh, been joined by, and Harold mentioned this point, the impact capital and uh, the ESG mindset, which is really um, move from what sounded like quite nice to have and good on a, on a corporate brochure to genuine large-scale uh, kite marking and drivers of behavior really from the consumer, from, from the investor, has now shaped a narrative that, that recognizes the value of investing in, um, into affordable homes. And of course, one of the final things coming out of GFC and, and proven again through 
the COVID-19 crisis is the resilience of relative resilience of an income stream and particularly pension funds love the stability of, of the cash flow, even if it's a much lower return profile than might be the case for other sectors, that risk adjusted return profile is, is, is pretty exciting. So there's this you know, quote unquote wall of capital, 330 billion of uh, dry powder as we refer to it um, across the globe going into to real estate that is unallocated. A proportion of that, of course, will be looking for exactly what, what we're talking about if the right sort of environment and the right sort of opportunities can be created. Thanks, Adam. And Harold, you founded your business 10 years ago, so you must have seen, seen that shift of kind of investor appetite. How did you get in your early stage investors? I know now everyone wants a piece of it, but how did you get that early story to kind of land? Sorry, Alex, uh, just ask that question again. The line was... Uh, uh, sorry. So as I said, you know, you started your business 10 years ago. So, you know, at that stage, the kind of impact investing idea wasn't really big in the market. So how did you get your kind of initial investors to, to support what you were trying to do in plugging that gap? Um, the South African market is very, very small. I think our, our capital base is, um, is insignificant if we had to compare it to, to most other regions. Um, but we do have a very strong institutional uh, market. We've got a very, very strong banking system and a very strong financial system. So to, to access quite sophisticated uh, market instruments and investment instruments is, is not that difficult. But to get to your point of, of impact investors, um, we follow global trends as well. Um, the, the fact that, that Adam has just mentioned ESG, we've been reporting on ESG to our um, to our investors for the last 10 years. So we've, come, we've come, become quite honed on, on how to package our reporting and the language and the narratives that we use. So it was relatively easy for us to take that and then to go into the market and, and package it for, for the true impact investors. But more than that as well, this is, um, Africa is, uh, is a story where a lot of people want to invest into. It's a very high risk environment, but they like the good stories. They like the good news stories. And, and we, use, we use that to, uh, to attract investors. Um, but we've become part of the global picture in the sense that anything that's got to do with sustainability, about energy security, how we generate our own energy, um, the social impact and so forth is simply part of a, a global story and we've picked up on it. But we've packaged it in, a, in the BTR um, frame of reference, which we didn't have previously. So we had a small PSR type of, 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 um, of investment genre, if you want to call it that, but the BTR market is relatively new. And I think also to what Adam had said is, is that um, now that retail, commercial, and, and all of those type of investments um, are definitely not the, the poster child of, of property investment, um, residential developments has suddenly become the, the one that people will sit up and listen to. And if you can then add ESG, um, impact, prop tech, and so forth on top of that, it becomes a lot easier to sell. Um, and then also stable returns. And in South Africa, we, uh, we can get above 10% above stable returns, which is a lot higher than you guys can get, but it does come with a risk, a risk premium. Yeah, well. that's, a, that's a risk adjusted return indeed, but it's a good one. It is. <laughs> It is. Thank you, Harold. Olivia, I just wanted to come back to you in that point that we were talking about the innovation that you pioneered within a relatively small London charity, but that has you know, had a huge amount of attention and focus across the UK. Are you seeing yourselves as kind of the incubator for the UK housing market? Are you seeing people trying to adopt the personalised rent models that you've developed? Yeah, there's, there's been interest about it and it sort of continues to go. And actually, I've been recently working on another research report which is looking at different models. There's been some implemented in Wales and it's a report bringing all of the, you know, I think there's two or three different, on, on different bases. I would say ours is probably the most granular in its application. Um, we've also launched at a, sec at a second property, as I said, it was originally created for the new era estate in Hackney. Um, I, and there is more and more take up. And I think that as we get, as we get more, um, interest in housing for key workers, which I think is one of the responses that we'll get from COVID-19. It's at that point that you've got a lot more income variation within the key worker sector than you might have, you know, within the traditional social housing sector. And at that point you need to, you're being asked to provide subsidized housing, but often for people that some people might see as relatively well off. So you do need at that point, I think something like personalized rents and, and looking about at how much help people actually need 
um, it will become more and more prevalent in, in what we're doing. Absolutely. Thank you. And related to that, Chris, you touched on the kind of the very kind of highly amenitized bells and whistles of a lot of what's been developed in the early stages of build to rent in the newer markets. So in the UK and in Australia, I think yeah. everyone starts at the prime end because it's perceived to be more, more stable. But actually, I'd love to know your kind of perspective on what product kind of shifts you might see and, you know, getting away from the idea that I've certainly had approached in the UK that you know, if something is affordable, it can therefore be poor quality and it doesn't really matter. And actually, how do we how do we build quality homes? And what are you offering in your core product that isn't hitting that gap market? Um, yes, yeah, so I guess there's a few answers to that question. In an approach to management, so we think professionally managed um, sort of wholly owned residential real assets is a sort of, um, is, a, is a key differentiator in the Australian market, whether that be at the sort of higher end, the middle end or the sort of lower end. So... So our very low and middle income tenants will access sort of, you know, on-site management and, and those sorts of things that they wouldn't be used to experiencing in either government housing or, or just sort of private rental accommodation. Um, and then in terms of sort of built form, so we sort of design and um, build our buildings to be sort of resilient owner-occupier focus or occupant-centric sort of type um, development. So, and we include spaces that uh, can be used. So we don't build six rooms and build one with treadmills, one for a cigar room, one with a day spa, one with all the sort of bells and all the sort of stuff that goes into sort of high end BTR. We provide multi-function communal rooms that can provide five or six different functions. So you might do yoga there in the very first thing in the morning, then there might be a parents group, then there sort of might be a sort of afternoon tea, then there might be movie night that night. So. So we provide a sort of a variety of space. We've got things like workshops where people can do little projects together. They can borrow tools off us. So, so we provide, and this is about, so we do that because A, that's good as energy, but B, that provides a chance for um, individuals within our developments to create bonds with each other. So because the data from the state says that in a multifamily context, if you can get a household to form two meaningful relationships with two other households in your project, then they'll stay 2.5 times longer. So that gives us good revenue security as well. So, so there's commerce for everything, like you gotta be the mitigating risk or sort of underwriting, you know, hence underwriting return or, or whatever. So if I'm saying to Aussie Super, we're gonna invest an extra million dollars in this project in workshops and communal rooms and whatever else, then, you know, there needs to be a logic to that. Um, so, so, yeah. That, that community retention stat, I think for me, is a great urban legend. I've never found a source for it, but it feels about right. I think for everybody who works, it's like, Adam, if you I found it, you I don't know. But, I know, I've mentioned it, but it's not, never, never been a source for it. But it feels kind of intuitively like it must be about right. But um, I just want to bring it back around to that kind of, um, the kind of tech point, but also the energy security. So Adam, you talked about kind of digital poverty and, and telehealth kind of things. Harold, you've done an amazing um, kind of linking in with the kind of... Um, an insurance group and the kind of people's activity and how that kind of links into um, and kind of usage and that kind of thing. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And maybe we can get into some of those ideas because I know all of you are pioneering stuff in, in that space. Yeah, sure. Um, we, um, in the past, we, we, a big burning point for us or a burning platform for us was, was reconciling energy usage. Um, literally our bulk meter from, from the grid and how do we then dispense energy so we, we started using smart meters, which is not new or not novel at all. Um, but it helped us to kind of equalize our usage at least. But then um, we started moving into an energy insecure future, specifically relating to, to electricity. Um, and we started adding PV plants to our developments. And that PV plant essentially runs our, our heat pump system, which acts as a big battery. So there's the system that will hold the hot water um, we don't know, need the type of insulation that you guys need in, in Europe. So um, our systems sit on top of our roofs and they, they act as big batteries and that's enough hot water usage for the evening and then the following morning. So that created a bit of margin and that margin we could plow back into our OPEX to cover some of our costs, but we could also then dispense the energy at a slightly lower rate than what the municipality would, would uh, normally ask a client if it was directly. But then we had to. Uh, we started using that um, that whole system to also um, dispense other services, whether that's cleaning services or other amenities. Um, but we also charge the rent through that management platform. 
And then we got this novel idea, which is probably not that novel, but to use our energy usage as, as a lever for, for rent to be paid. So simply, it's a wallet. Um, if you've got a credit on your wallet and the system reconciles every night at 12 o'clock, says you use so much energy and it gets deducted from your wallet. If you still have a credit, your energy stays on. But if, uh, if you don't have a credit, like you would have a data package on your, on your mobile network, you have to top it up on a, on a regular basis if you don't have a monthly contract. Um, but if you don't have credit, it will switch off and the ball valve for the hot water system and, and electricity would switch off. And that's a great incentive to make sure that your rent is paid. So what had happened is, is that on the older stock where we don't have the system, um, our unrecovered rent is as a percentage much, much higher than it is on the new stock. Um, so we use comfort rather than legislation to entice people to pay their rent, but also to leave if they can't. Because we often we sit with a situation where it takes an enormous amount of time, energy and money to get rid of people that can't pay. But if you can't access energy in any other way than on your app, on your phone and your wallet, um, you simply then decide to leave. And that's really what we wanted. But it's created a whole subsystem and a, a new technology platform that we didn't necessarily intend when we started out of it. But it's a whole um, community management tool. So everything from, from maintenance to communication to um, arranging meetings to talking to specific clients to talking to groups to talking to blocks. Um, it, it is, uh, it's become a great management tool for us. It's, it's very much still um, in its infancy and, and it doesn't mean that tech is easy to use. Um, we've got meters that don't run, but we've created red flag systems that tell us there's, there's problems. Um, so in, the, the, in summary, energy has become our lever to entice people to pay for, yeah. for their rent and it's been hugely successful. So our, our unrecovered rent on these new developments are basically in, insignificant. It's a, yeah. a non-issue. And obviously our investors love that story. So, mm -hmm. uh, And actually, uh, if, you're, if your community residents are actually in experiencing challenges, they're more likely to come to you earlier to try and negotiate a bit more sort of support and assistance. And, so and you're actually getting better retention as well. Absolutely. And, and we, we saw that now in the last three months. Um, so although we don't have a uh, personalized rent like you do, Olivia, um, but we did, we did engage with every single client who had an issue and we would then make an arrangement with them. Um, and it, it really worked wonderfully. I mean, um, Adam, you said earlier 95% of the UK paid their rent on time. Unfortunately, in South Africa, it dropped from 88% to 72% um, in the last month, but we're sitting on 92%. So we're far in excess of the average and, and that technology was a big enabler for us to be able to do that. And Adam, there's an interesting point around those kind of ESG sustainability bits that, you know, in the, I was working in that space during the GFC and there was a perception that it would then fall off the priority list because, you know, we just needed to focus on survival and return. And equally now you, you kind of alluded to that some people perceive it as, as a complicating factor, that it's perhaps discretionary, but actually a lot of us would argue that that sustainability needs to be, needs to be core. Um, are, what's your predictions around that? Yeah, uh, for me, it's a really important point. And as a differentiator from the GFC, we're, we're seeing a perspective that is, is night and day. Your GFC response was about uh, cost minimization, just get up and going and, and really um, uh, you know, sustainability in the UK and, and for, for sections of Europe, it sort of fell, fell, fell away or certainly uh, lost its, its importance and significance. But today, the story is different because it's a story around uh, building more resilient cash flows, building more resilient properties. And resilience in the broader sense means better communities and maybe some of the, the, the points that have already been raised by Harold and Chris uh, and, and Olivia as well, being more responsive to what your, uh, your occupier requires. Ultimately, all of that is wrapped in a broader mindset around ESG that says, actually, if we're if we're better at doing our jobs as property managers and we're better at working with our tenants and managing the requirements and uh, if we're creating uh, more desirable, more sustainable properties, the, the cash flow point, which has come up in, in, in each of the three examples, is, is more secure. And ultimately, you know, whether we like it or not, that, that cash flow point is so important to be able to drive the investment flows, whether it's, um, uh, you know, whether it's, registered providers in the UK or, um, or, or whether it's uh, pure private sector involvement, being able to see visibility on that cash flow trajectory 
uh, is uh, is really important to underwrite the next wave of activity. So um, I really encourage that you can today talk about uh, ESG as a mindset being a real enabler to more activity as opposed to where we were 10 years ago. Super, thank you. Guys, just coming to the kind of end of our time here, I just wanted to ask you each for a quick kind of 12 months, hopefully post COVID prediction, but also something kind of longer term that you're seeing in the kind of wider affordable housing. What do you think the next big innovation might be? And given you're all kind of pioneering amazing things in that. While you have a little think, I'm just gonna whistle, you know, we've covered a huge amount around the kind of impact of investors and institutional market, really recognizing the stability and that income generation potential of, of the affordable housing sector, particularly the shifts in kind of product, um, things around energy security and digital um, poverty and access and how those can be used both in the sort of development and operations, but actually long-term community management and really addressing the gap market, regardless of the terminology that we all use. I think that's that point that there's a huge chunk of the population that are not eligible for government support at the social housing end, the lowest level, but can't access the, ha access the housing market securely or safely. So it's fantastic to see these innovations coming through. Um, so Chris, starting with you in the Southern Hemisphere, um, can you give us a couple of quick predictions to finish up? Sure, so I think um, for us yeah, down in Oz, uh, post COVID, um, we'll see um, institutionally owned housing, so residential real assets, so it emerges um, just an enormous part of the market, an enormous sort of mechanism for or method for the delivery of, of new housing where it's always been built to sell, so off the plan sold housing and, and, and that sort of a model. Um, and the other thing I think that potentially we will see in Australia is potentially sort of given sort of touch wood, um, our sort of government's handling of the crisis is we may see us become um, sort of an even more attractive location for international inbound capital. So to sort of say, well, if you can sort of invest in X or Y or whatever, then um, we're sort of expecting that to be the case. And also for sort of net migration as well to be sort of an, also an attractive place to sort of come and live for you know, international middle class. So, but we'll see. So. We'll see. Great stuff, thank you so much. Olivia, how about you from London? Uh, so for me, particularly post COVID, I mean, it always has been, but it's all about key workers. Uh, it's about those people that, you know, are the powerhouse of our economy and really a recognition now that we firstly need to redefine key workers. Um, as Adam mentioned earlier, actually, when you can work from home, your need as a key worker to be near your place of work is less than those that actually need to be near their place of, their place of work. And I think the other thing that's been quite widely discussed and again links back to key workers is, you know, to, to, to accelerate us out of this recession and to, to build us back up. One of the things is going to be um, investment in housing delivery. And if we invest in affordable housing for key workers, you know, we can increase the amount of affordable housing that's provided because the rents that could be charged are slightly more than the social rents. And I think that that's something that we as a, as a society need to do post COVID. Super, thank you, Olivia. Lots of nodding there. Harold, how about you from South Africa? Yeah, I, I agree with Chris. I, I think um, South Africa is gearing up for a small Marshall Plan. Uh, Post-COVID, we, we have a, a massive uphill battle to, to get our economy going again. Um, housing is luckily part of that plan, and um, we see that uh, institutional funds will play a big role in, in gearing up um, in investing in those type of BTR developments. Um, and as the other type of, of property assets become less desirable in retail and commercial, and the stable returns of, of uh, residential is, is agreed to and acknowledged, um, I think that's a big trend. And then the other thing is um, we need to provide housing fast and, and, and uh, more affordable, as you all do. But I think modular design and modular housing in South Africa is, is I, I can hear the the narrative and the talk is, is gearing up. So maybe we're a year behind you guys, but it's definitely a big part of, of our next 12 to 24 months. You're doing a perfect segue in for Mr. Chalice there and then one of his uh, pet projects. <laughs> uh, uh, modern methods of construction, Adam? Uh, the modern methods of construction soapbox. Uh, so uh, the short answer, Harold, is I'm, I'm with you 100% on that final point. Um, what I thought, uh, Alex, I thought I would just maybe center my comments is, is more of a cautionary tale rather than one of prediction uh, out and out for the, uh, for the future. The bottleneck for me is around, you know, this is this great wave of capital. We, we've, we've all talked about it. And there's a big opportunity to use that capital for purpose with respect to delivering lowercase a and large case a affordable housing. 
The bottleneck for me is around being able to genuinely convince policymakers, genuinely convince local authorities, planners, a skeptical public that that private sector capital is there to do good. Uh, one of the things that we hear a lot about is, at least within our industry, is our intentions uh, and our drivers. And invariably, uh, too often they get undermined by uh, strong commercial acumen or whatever it is that uh, ultimately means that a skeptical public and a skeptical um, uh, 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 policy uh, environment uh, is, uh, is not allowing or not enabling that capital to the extent that it could um, uh, drive the sort of benefits at the pace that we, we need right across the world. And so for me, if this, the, audience, uh, the audience for this uh, webinar is, is listening, get those messages clear, get those messages um, strong with respect to your purpose and make sure that you're opening up that dialogue with your uh, public sector partners, because ultimately that will be uh, the key to unlocking a much new, a much greater wave of new, new capital in the sector. Absolutely. And uh, challenging those negative perceptions of the evil developer is, I think, something we've all got quite an experience of. Um, guys, we're kind of out of time and I'm so enormously grateful to you for persevering with our own little tech challenges here, but also the disappointment of not being together in person. I, there is so much more we could talk about, including those kind of modern methods of construction and other opportunities around engaging planners and policy changes. Um, I really hope that perhaps Reed Meadham will invite us back when uh, Mithun reconvenes in person and we can, we can get together again because there's lots to talk about. But thank you all so much, Olivia Harris, Harold Spees, Chris Staff, and Adam Chalice. You've all been brilliant. And um, stay safe and well, and hopefully see you soon. Thanks.